All right, well, I'm excited to talk with everyone about North Carolina's wonderful wetlands. <clears throat> you know, research shows that spending time with nature will reduce your blood pressure and boost your immune system and reduce stress and anxiety. And it turns out that even looking at pictures of nature can have some of these benefits. So I have lots of pictures of North Carolina's nature in this presentation. So if you remember nothing at all from what I say, I hope you come away from it still benefiting from looking at all these wonderful places in North Carolina. So the first thing I want to define for you is what a wetland is and what an upland is. I know a lot of us are familiar with this, but it's a good place to start. Um, we find wetlands in places where water is at the surface long enough to affect the plants and animals that live there. And uplands occur where the water table is far enough below the surface that a whole different suite of plants grow there and also the soil looks different. In a lot of North Carolina, we have that rusty red color um, soil. And in the coastal plain, we have sandy soils in the uplands. So the main factors that we consider when determining if an area is wetland is we look for the presence of water and the types of plants that are there. And then also what the soil looks like and feels like. So sometimes you'll see water standing in a wetland and sometimes you won't, but we still would call it a wetland. And this is because the water is at or near the surface long enough to change the soils and also the vegetation growing there. So one of the ways that we look for the presence of water, even if it's not uh, visible at the surface is things like sediment deposits from water coming in and sitting for a while or uh, water stain lines on the trees. Sometimes we can see that or if uh, sometimes there's rack lines where water has come in and pushed or floated in uh, sticks and things like that. So all of these are evidence that water has been in this place for a while, even if we don't see it. And then a few things happen with the soils when water sits in an area for a while. Uh, the top right picture is a picture of when the water stays there long enough that anaerobic conditions develop and the organic matter uh, accumulates. So we end up with muck in, that, in those situations. And um, I'm sure, Many of us associate muck with wetlands. That is why the organic matter accumulates and um, under these anaerobic conditions, that's also when we get the bacteria that create the rotten egg odor that sometimes you smell uh, if you disturb the soil in wetlands. But then we also have other situations where the water does, uh, it kind of comes and goes it is not there year round. And so um, water will stay there long enough to develop the anaerobic conditions, which then changes the color of the soil. And the way that it does that is we have the iron in the soil and manganese and under, under anaerobic conditions, they are reduced to iron. The iron oxide is reduced to iron, which takes it from that red brown color to a gray. And then uh, when oxygen returns to the area, like the water drains off, it dries out in the summer or um, the flooding you know, goes away, then oxygen might return. And when that happens, we have uh, the iron turning back into iron oxide. It, so that can happen at the tips of roots or it can just happen from uh, the area drying out. So the result is more of what we see on the left side of this slide where we have a modeled appearance. We have gray, but we have these little pockets of iron oxide. And this is a, um, a great example of that gray color with patches of oxidized iron. 
This is clearly a wetland soil, even if we don't see water in the area. Incidentally, sometimes when you're in a wetland or near a small stream, you might see rust colored or orange water, like in these pictures. This is actually, this is not pollution, even though it looks like it is. Uh, instead, this is iron oxidizing bacteria that turn the water into a rust color. Because we have so much water or iron in our groundwater here, the presence of this iron oxidizing bacteria is a good indication that the groundwater is at the surface in the area. And then the third factor we looked at or look at in determining if an area is indeed a wetland is what kind of plants are growing there. So certain species are able to tolerate and thrive with saturated soils or standing water. Our wetlands in North Carolina are home to a fabulous diversity of wetland plants, which I'm sure you uh, know about and I'll talk about in a few minutes. But uh, so what are our wetlands good for besides providing lots of habitat for mosquitoes, for fish and bats? For a long time, they have been viewed as wastelands or areas that need to be filled or drained, but people have since realized they provide very important functions and benefits to not only human society, but also the environment in general. Wetlands are important for resupplying aquifers, which we use for our drinking water. And they also capture or slow down water after rains during floods, and then slowly release that water back to the streams and rivers. And because there's lots of vegetation in them, usually and bioactive processes going on, they also help clean the water as it moves through either uh, to a river or stream or down into the aquifers. And of course, a huge reason I love wetlands is because they're so full of life. If you are near a wetland, no matter what time of year, you are bound to see, hear, smell evidence of this life, whether it be birds, insects, plants, fish, and invertebrates, mammals. Wetlands in North Carolina are particularly important to our rare and endangered species. 70% uh, of our state's rare and endangered animals depend on wetlands for some part of their life cycle. And all this life makes them fun places to visit, to immerse yourself in and experience that life. Another uh, aspect of our wetlands is the importance of them what to is the migratory birds. They are, um, they're important to my, as a migratory stop off or Overwintering areas cannot be overestimated. The wetlands in and around several national wildlife refuges in North Carolina, like the PD and Madden Mesquite and Pocosin Lakes National Wildlife Refuges, they are home, winter home to hundreds of thousands of snow geese, tundra swans, American coots, northern pintail ducks, and shorebirds. Uh, we interviewed the biologist out at Madame Mesquite National Wildlife Refuge, and she told us in 2017 there were 380,000 ducks, swans, and geese at that refuge alone. So the wetlands in eastern North Carolina in particular, but also the PD National Wildlife Refuge in the South Piedmont are invaluable for these populations of birds that migrate up to the tundra. And with our long coastline, North Carolina has a large fishery with an annual harvest of wetland dependent commercial fish and shellfish worth $660 million a year. And there are even more benefits, so you could go on and on, but um, they provide pollinator refuges, and especially in agricultural areas, provide shoreline stabilization in the coastal areas, and also carbon sequestration all around. Our wetlands are protected under the Clean Water Act and under state law because they 
impact and connect to downstream waters and affect water quality. Unfortunately, however, that protection has been under attack in the last decade at the federal and state level, um, but they are definitely worth protecting. So what threatens our wetlands? What threats are impacting them in a, uh, North Carolina? One of the issues that we have in our wetlands is excessive sedimentation, which uh, can happen when in urban areas in particular. This is a picture of a wetland along urban Walnut Creek in Raleigh, North Carolina, which experiences high fluctuations in water levels and it floods the nearby wetlands that are there uh, fairly often. And, and sometimes can overwhelm them like in this picture. And because water runs into our wetlands, we often see trash carried into them. We have invasive non-native species like kudzu and Japanese stilt grass and alligator weed and phragmites that are sometimes major threats to the integrity of our wetlands. And of course, development encroaches on buffers and wetlands all across the state, but especially in urban areas and along our transportation corridors. Logging is another common impact to our wetlands in North Carolina. And while it is uh, considered a temporary impact, it's still obviously, as you can see in this picture, uh, takes away a lot of those important functions for a while until it can regrow. And our wetlands um, have also been pretty extensively ditched and drained for agriculture and timber lands in the past, uh, all across the state, but particularly in the eastern half of the state. And we're seeing effects of sea level rise in our wetlands along the coast where saltwater intrusion into areas that were not that long ago freshwater has killed off trees and converted forested wetlands into brackish marshes. Higher seas also have the effect of raising water levels further inland on the creeks and rivers. So we're also seeing impacts of longer inundation in areas that used to dry out. But on to a more positive topic. Before I talk about the kinds of wetlands we have and the plants that are in them, I'd like to point out this new resource we have from the Division of Water Resources. Uh, it is a 425 page fully illustrated book that was just released this spring online or early summer. Uh, I am in the process of getting hard copies printed and they will be available for no charge if you pick them up in Raleigh or for the cost of shipping. Um, just send me an email if you'd like a copy and I will work on getting them out to you. So in the meantime, we have a free download of this on uh, ncwetlands.org slash plant guide. I will also preface this by saying I do have a lot of knowledge about wetland plants in North Carolina, but I am not actually a botanist, a trained botanist. Um, and I rely on expert botanists for checking content. And this is an update uh, to the 1997 Division of Water Resources Guide to wetland plants that was uh, put together, written and illustrated by Karen Kendig. So I worked to update it and, and um, create the general design and added about 50 new species and uh, took lots and lots of pictures too for this guide. So inside in the front of the book, I have a section that describes different wetland types in North Carolina, along with uh, lists of common species that are found in each type and maps of general maps of where they're found. And then inside uh, I have other sections demonstrating leaf characteristics and table contents for different subsections 
and a section at the back with illustrated comparisons of commonly confused species. This is a typical page layout for each species that's in there with photos of the identifying features on the left and then drawing and descriptions and general uh, location information on the right side. So next I'll be talking about the different kinds of wetlands we have in North Carolina and also the plant species that are found in them very commonly. Uh, we have three main ecoregions in North Carolina. We have the mountains on the west, the rolling hills of the Piedmont in the center part of the state, and then the flatter coastal plain to the east. And I will generally be mentioning types of wetlands from west to east. So in the mountains, we have mountain bogs, which are open wetland areas that are found in relatively flat spaces at the bases of the mountain slopes where long-term ground saturation makes ideal situation for lots of different kinds of wetland plants. Many of them are unique uh, herbaceous or non-woody plants. These bogs tend to be small the median size of wetlands in North Carolina's mountains is only a tenth of an acre. Mountain bogs support extensive mats of sphagnum moss in accumulations that are not found in other landscapes in North Carolina. So it's actually pretty fun to walk in a bog. It feels like you're walking or bouncing on a wet sponge. Only 20 percent of North Carolina's original bogs still exist in their unaltered condition though. So because most of them have been ditched or filled for farming. So it is really special to come across one or to be able to visit one. And as I said before, sphagnum moss is a dominant feature in mountain bogs where the moss creates an accumulation of deep organic soils and um, organic material for the plants to grow in. Um, a few tree species will grow in the mountain bogs like the red maple and the tag alder, but also smaller trees and woody shrubs like the black willow and the silky willow, elderberry, and the swamp rose. Lots of herbaceous species are found in our mountain bogs including juncus species and scurpus species, cinnamon fern, the cattail, and the uh, sedges that like the sun because they tend to be in open, sunnier areas. And because so few of our natural bogs are left, we have several threatened and endangered species that occur in them. One of my favorites is the carnivorous pitcher plants which uh, we have three species that occur in mountain wetlands. They are listed. And then also the swamp pink, which is another fun plant. It is listed as threatened. And another of my favorites from this type of wetland, even though it's not endangered, is the woodland bulrush with its lovely alternating bands of green and red. So look for that one next time you're out in the mountains. Some examples for where you can see some publicly accessible mountain bogs are listed at the bottom of the slide. And probably my absolute favorite is Panther Town Valley Bog in, in the Nantahala National Forest. It is a bit of a hike to get down to that bog, but it is really beautiful. Okay. We also have statewide, we have riverine swamp forests, which occur extensively in North Carolina and in other southern states and even in other countries. This is a very common type of wetland that occurs along the floodplains of rivers and receives much of its water from these floods, um, flooding rivers but they also do receive water from rain and surface runoff, 
or and or groundwater. Um, you can see in the photo at the right, the water stain lines on the trees. So this is evidence that as the, the levels of the water change over the course of the year, um, the water come, you know, up, comes up and goes down. But it does sit long enough to create these stain lines on the trees. Uh, included in the riverine forest wetlands, we have bottomland hardwood forests and riverine swamp forests. They're two different types that often occur in close association with each other, and they can be difficult to tell apart. Uh, the riverine swamp forests tend to have fl flowing water through them, channels, they tend to be closer to the rivers, and they may transition into bottomland hardwoods further away from the rivers. Bottomland hardwood uh, forests, swamp forests, they tend to have uh, like floodplain pools in them also. Many species of water tolerant trees constitute the majority of plant cover in this type of wetland, but some shrubs and some herbaceous species are found in these wetlands also. So here's some commonly found tree species in this type of riverine forest wetland in the Piedmont and the coastal plain. Uh, we have tupelos, a couple of different types of tupelos. Those are the ones that are starting to turn red. Now they are some of the earliest tree species that just have a few red leaves. Um, and then further east, we have bald cypress in these types of swamps and um, in the Piedmont, American elm and cherry bark oak also pretty common. You'll notice that all of these trees show buttressing at the base of their trunks, and that is to help them stay upright in these wet or unstable soils. Of course, there's other tree species occurring in these places too. Um, these are commonly found and also some of my favorites. I like the shape of the leaves in swamp chestnut oak and the way the trunk grows and the ironwood. It's this wonderful muscular bark look. Green ash has some really cool bark and I love the shape of the leaves in tulip trees. Tulip trees being the tallest hardwood in North America. And then we have lots of shrubs that grow in these wetlands. Uh, here's a collection of them that all have white flowers. The um, Virginia sweet spire and the tai tai. The tai tai has a really unique looking leaf where it's wider at the top than the bottom, wider at the end than where the stem is, and also a very prominent midrib on the back of the leaf. And sweet leaf, or horse sugar as it's also called, really does taste sweet if you don't mind the fuzziness on the backs of the leaves. Uh, and I really like Clethra, the coastal sweet pepper bush, the shape of the leaf and this one. It's not serrated near the base of the leaf, but it's serrated at the um, top half of the leaf. And then we all should know to look out for that fuzzy vine of uh, poison ivy. It is often growing in association with spot, uh, jewelweed and patients on the right, the bottom right. This is a good thing because the sap from jewelweed is supposed to help counteract a poison ivy rash. So keep that in mind if you didn't know that. We also have uh, lots of other herbaceous plants that grow in these wetlands, but lizard's tail is a very common species that often grows in colonies and it has this unique drooping flower. Giant cane is also very common in these wetlands. It will grow en masse and mainly reproduces by rhizomes, but uh, once in a while, it will seed. Apparently, every 
40 to 50 years, it will seed right before it dies. So if you happen to see uh, the giant cane in seed, consider yourself lucky. And I also really like the Indian wood oats, which have this wonderful, very, very flattened seed head of spikelets on this really fine stem. Here are two species that grow in the riverine forest. They are easily confused with each other. The uh, false nettle or bomeria has less glossy leaves than the Canadian clearweed, and it also has unbranching inflorescences, whereas the clearweed has branched inflorescences. And then the clearweed also has like three prominent main veins that, that go from the base of the leaf to the tip. It, it grows a little bit smaller, but when these two are young, it's not the easiest to tell them apart. And then of course, lots and lots of ferns. These five are probably the most common that you'll see and they're not that difficult to tell apart. I think my favorite is probably the royal fern because it has such a unique look to it. Uh, but these are in the, the wetland plant guidebook and you can look for tips and tricks for telling them apart. There's lots of places in North Carolina where you can find riverine swamp forests and bottomlands in the Piedmont and coastal plain. So my favorites are listed in the bottom of the slide. These are places that I have particu seen particularly large trees. And the Black River Swamp is also worth mentioning because it's uh, down by Wilmington where the oldest cypress trees in the whole world have been found. One of them dated to 2,624 years old. In the mountains, in the riverine forests, you will also see more sycamores and river birches along with the maples and alders and lots of ferns and lots of jewelweed also. Moving on to the next wetland type, we have seep wetlands. They're so named because the groundwater seeps to the surface and they're often found along slopes that lead down into floodplains. And they're characterized by the presence of slow moving groundwater that is unable to come, it kind of comes down the hill, but then it's unable to penetrate the underlying clay or bedrock and is kind of stuck at the surface. The soil is saturated for most, if not all of the year, and there's not usually enough water uh, coming all at once to flow or form channels in a seep wetland. And the vegetation can range from small non-woody plants to large hardwood trees. As far as plants in the Piedmont, at least, it seems like whenever I see a seep, uh, possum haw viburnum is in it and jack in the pulpit. Um, in these places, we also get lots of giant cane and cinnamon fern, ironwood, red maple, and shade tolerant Carex species like Carex atlantica and Carex crinida, which are shown on the right there. Some examples of where you can find these are listed at the bottom. Then we have freshwater marshes, which are uh, found in a wide variety of landscape contexts. They can be along rivers, canals, estuaries. They can, they're um, often up in the upper reaches of streams that flow into lakes or ponds. They can be at the bases of wet slopes in the mountains in particular or in, in just relatively flat places where the groundwater is uh, naturally close to the surface. Marshes, freshwater marshes generally do not have trees. They have a wide variety of herbaceous, small non-woody plants like the cattail and rushes and sedges and other soft tissue flowering plants. 
this freshwater marsh in this picture is from Turnip Seed Nature Preserve, which is east of Raleigh. Different species of rushes are common in freshwater marshes. Probably the most common of these is Juncus suffusus or soft rush, but all the Juncuses are characterized by these wonderful round, soft stems and interesting seed heads that either come off the side of one of the stems or are terminal up at the top. And then Rincospora species are called beak rushes or beak sedges because they have these elongated spikelets that are shaped like long beaks. And their stems are smooth and they may be triangular, but they may also be round in cross section. And uh, freshwater marshes will have sun loving species of cyperus and carex. They usually, those days usually have triangular flowering stems and cross section. Cyperus are usually found in more uh, in wetter conditions or standing water. And they have flattened spikelets if you look closely. The sun loving carrot species are usually found in shallower water or on the edges, um, moist edges. And they have keeled leaves or leaves that have kind of a fold down the length of them. And they also have spiky fruits. All of these plants provide really important food sources for birds and mammals and freshwater wetlands, especially in the winter time. And a lot of the national wildlife refuges around the state will plant these species so that they have them as food for the migratory birds when they come down. Other herbaceous species that are quite common in freshwater marshes include the green arrow arum with its wonderful arrowhead shaped leaves and the pickerel weed with the purple flowers and heart shaped leaves. I particularly like sparganium, the American burr weed because of these spiky balls that it has those fruits and its rounded uh, leaf tips. All three of those species are commonly uh, growing in standing water that can handle that. And then redroot is another interesting plant in freshwater marshes. It, it, its distribution is probably more South Piedmont, Eastern Piedmont and uh, the coastal plain, but it has bright red sap if you break the stems and these wonderful red or orange roots. This plant, red root, likes to grow on the edges of freshwater wetlands, but in the sun. And I also have seen it uh, in, uh, on some floating mats in a uh, wetland. It, that was a Carolina Bay type wetland, which I'll describe in a few minutes, but um, they particularly like the sun. We also find a few woody shrubs in our freshwater wetlands or our freshwater marshes, including the super cool button bush plant with its spiky ball flowers and its button like fruits. And wax myrtle is also commonly found uh, as well as the swamp rose mallow with its beautiful showy white flowers with that pink center. And sometimes you'll get black willow in there, cattail in there, so big variety. And then if there's an open water component to these marshes, we will often see yellow pond lily and American water lily, and sometimes water shield, which I get very excited when I see that one floating around because if you pull it up, you'll see it has gel, this wonderful gel on the undersides of the leaves and along the stems. And I, I believe it's to deter bugs from munching on it, but I think it's so awesome. <laughs> so good examples of freshwater marsh wetlands uh, around the triad are Richardson Taylor Preserve and Tanglewood. Um, Salem Lake also has some 
In North Carolina, we have some freshwater marshes that are tidally influenced, as well as those that are non-tidal, which was mainly what I was describing. But this is an example of a tidally influenced freshwater marsh at Goose Creek State Park, which is, I think, off of the News River, uh, where the water in it is still all freshwater, but when the tide is low, the water drains out of this wetland more quickly than when the tide is high. So, the, so the, depending on the wind and the tide, um, the water level in this marsh will be fluctuating. So the plants that grow there have to be adapted to these fluctuating uh, water levels. Statewide, we also have basin wetlands or depressional wetlands, which are those found in natural depressions that are surrounded by uplands. These wetlands are usually less than a quarter acre in size uh, and rainwater collects in them and creates temporary or permanent pools. Many of them dry out for much of the year, so they provide great breeding areas for amphibians because predatory fish are not there to eat their eggs. Basin wetlands can look like marshes like these with in the Crow Ten National Forest without trees or they can look like swamps with trees and shrubs, depending on factors like fire, water duration, and soil type. The one in the bottom left is a picture of an upland depression in the URs. Closed canopy basins tend to have species similar to riverine or bottomland hardwood wetland species, whereas the open canopy ones tend to have more uh, freshwater marsh type species. And then a wonderful uh, wetland type in North Carolina and the Southeast in general, uh, unique to the Southeastern portion of the coastal plain. Most of them occur in North Carolina are the Pocosins. The word Pocosin is an Algonquin Native American term meaning swamp on a hill. And uh, Pocosins develop in areas where ancient river valleys were filled in with sand, silt, and clay from the eroding Appalachian Mountains to the west. And over thousands of years, dead plant matter accumulated in these wet low places, building up kind of a slightly hilly formation. Because of their landscape position, they don't, you don't naturally have streams flowing into them. So their main source of water is precipitation. Pocosins can be very demanding places for plants to grow. The water is quite acidic, like pH of three, and low in nutrients and uh, only replenished by rain, as I said. And evergreen shrubs grow very densely in pocosins. There's not too many species, but uh, they thrive there with a deep organic material in the soil. Very few of the non-woody plants that we're used to seeing in wetlands are found in Pocosins, and they can be very difficult places to walk through because they are so dense. Uh, the pictures, the two pictures on the left are me following my coworkers just barging through these places. Uh, the picture on the right, a lovely little path, is in a Pocosin in the Green Swamp Nature Preserve down near Wilmington. Pocosins tend to be dominated by evergreen-leaved shrub species like the gallberry, lionia, and inkberry. And we also find lots of smilax, laurifolia, crawling all over everything. This is a tough thick stemmed smilax species with tough leathery leaves. And um, sometimes we, it's difficult. <laughs> it's kind of a painful experience walking through these pocosins sometimes. Very few kinds of trees can survive in a true pocosin, but one of them is the gnarly pond pine with its uniquely shaped flat-ended cones. And then several kinds of bays are found in the Pocosins, Sweet Bay, Loblolly Bay, and Swamp Bay. 
Uh, good examples for finding Pocosins are in the Green Swamp, like I mentioned, Pocosin Lakes National Wildlife Refuge, Crotan has extensive areas, and Suggs Mill Pond Gameland is um, a little south of Fayetteville, but it's also a beautiful place with a Pocosin fringe on it. This is a photo from above Pocosin Lakes National Wildlife Refuge. Can you imagine trying to walk through that? <laughs> if you look closely to this photo, you might be able to see the little white dots on the trees. Those are the loblolly bays blooming with their showy white flowers. If you can catch a tree, a, a loblolly bay, Gordonia, blooming in late summer, they bloom from July to September, it's really a beautiful sight with their super straight trunks and their reddish bark and those big white flowers. Next is Carolina bays, which are not really a wetland type per se, but they are a unique elliptical landscape feature found in the coastal plain of the US and from New Jersey all the way down to Georgia. These are large and small oval depressions. You can see in the aerial photo at the bottom, there's a variety of sizes scattered through. Uh, they are not associated with streams or other water bodies. And in North Carolina, they are all oriented in the same Northwest and Southeast direction. If you hop on Google Earth for fun sometime, take a look at uh, Eastern North Carolina from the air. It, it's really wild. And it turns out these were not really discovered until people took to the air and realized that there's all these opals all over the, the coastal plain. Sometimes they're called oriented lakes because they're consistently in the same direction. In North Carolina in particular, it the direction that they're oriented is actually different depending on where you are in the nation. Uh, further north, it's a different orientation than down by Georgia, but in North Carolina, this is the way they're all oriented. Geological experts agree that they were created by the scooping action of glacial winds over the semi-arid plains south of the glacial ice. And, uh, if you ever hear a talk about Carolina bays, um, sometimes they'll mention analysis of the soil or the sand on the southeast side, where basically, and they're able to age the soil. Basically, they, they can see that older soil is on top of younger soil. So that's one of the supports for this idea that they're, they were basically like scooped out by the wind. Over time, with glacial retreat and rising sea levels, they were filled with water and wetland plants. Today, the primary source of water in these Carolina bays is precipitation, and the water is quite acidic and tannic from the organic material it builds up in them. You can see how dark it is like tea in this picture from Jones Lake State Park. There are many Carolina bays in North Carolina and along with being open water lakes, they also can resemble other kinds of wetlands. They can contain a variety of wetland types, um, like Pocosins especially, but also freshwater marshes sometimes and cypress swamps. The name Carolina Bay actually comes from the consistent presence of the bay trees as opposed to Bay of water, but like the Lapalali Bay, the Swamp Bay, and the Sweet Bay. In the coastal plain, we also have pine wetlands. They uh, sometimes are called pine flats or pine savannas. This is a type of forested wetland that is found on the sandy soils of coastal plain states, including North Carolina, and the water table in these wetlands stays close enough to the surface to foster certain water tolerating plants, including the longleaf pine, pond pine, and wetland shrubs and herb 
certain herbaceous species. Pine savannas are dominated by longleaf pines with a ground cover of wire grass and herbaceous plants scattered in. These habitats are dependent on cycles of fire for destruction and regrowth. Longleaf pines have been extensively logged in North Carolina. So the area of natural savannas like this in North Carolina is only about 15 or 5% of its original extent. This picture is from a lovely example in Green Swamp Nature Preserve. A variety of pines can be found in these wetlands like loblolly pines and longleaf and pond pine. And we also have southern bayberry, which is related to the common wax myrtle, but it has wider leaves and generally smaller, low, uh, lower height growing. Bayberry leaves have little, uh, if you look under in a magnifying glass, they have tiny little orange resinous dots only on the backs of the leaves. And they also have a darker fruit. And wax myrtle has these resinous dots on both sides of the leaves. You'll also find ink berry there. And in the green swamp, lots of carnivorous plants, including the Venus flytrap, which is always very exciting to see. And you'll also have um, in these wetlands, Aristida stricta, the pineland, three on, and uh, several different kinds of green cosperas, as well as a variety of wildflowers and other herbs. Some places where you can see wetlands like this are listed at the bottom. Now moving toward the coast, we have estuarine woody wetlands that are found at the edges of estuaries and salt marshes. Their water levels are a bit unpredictable because they are affected by wind tides and also flooding from ocean tides, uh, from salt water or brackish water. The plants found in these wetlands are primarily woody vegetation like trees and large shrubs that can adapt to the changing water levels as well as the chemical influences of salt water. The estuarine woody wetland on the right is at Fort Macon State Park. This is an example of an estuarine woody wetland at the Swan Corridor National Wildlife Refuge. Bell Island Pier with its marsh elder bushes and the understory of salt meadow cordgrass, Spartina paintings. The woody trees and shrubs found in these wetlands include uh, Atlantic white cedar, marsh elder, and baccarus. Sometimes you'll see wax myrtle also. And then under foot, you will uh, frequently see salt, salt meadow cord grass, the Spartina paintings, and salt grass. You can sometimes find other salt marsh species as well. So that's up next. Salt marshes are found where ocean tides provide regular flooding with salt water, like this area on the right, which is in Fort Fisher State Recreation Area near Wilmington. Salt marshes are dominated by smooth cord grass. It's a very, very salt tolerant plant. But uh, when you, if you see these marshes, also keep an eye out for the sea oxide daisy, which is a fun one with its round, spiky little fruits after the flowers have gone. And then the Carolina sea lavender also is often scattered in with the salt grass. And then Spartina patens also will grow in, in salt marshes. One of my favorite things about salt marshes is the entertaining little fiddler crabs. But you can see good examples of these at Fort Fisher State Recreation Area and Lee's Nature Park, which is in Wrightsville and Hammocks Beach State Park. If a marsh receives a mixture of fresh water and salt water, it will be brackish, which means it'll have a salinity from about 0.5 to up to 30. 
parts per thousand. Brackish marshes can occur pretty far inland in North Carolina, such as this one along the Noose River, which is uh, up near New Bern. And in this photo, I see sawgrass, which has those little bunches of brown seeds on the seed head and big cord grass, which is Spartina sinusoroides, the feathery seed heads. I see black needle rush over on the right and Atlantic white cedar in the background. All of these are brackish tolerant species. So they can't quite Usually don't see them in places where it's straight um, salt water, but they can tolerate a fair, fair amount of salt. So here's another slide listing those herbaceous species. The black needle rush will grow in extensive stands like those that you can see in Oak Island and near Fort Fisher or the game lens on Roanoke Island. Big cord grass is going to get really big, six to nine feet tall. And watch out for sawgrass because it is aptly named with its sharp hook-like teeth on the edges of its blades. There's good examples of the, these uh, brackish marshes all, uh, all along the coast of North Carolina. So if you're wondering how to find a publicly accessible wetland in North Carolina, we have a wonderful website resource with the Division of Water Resources, ncwetlands.org, where we have a table of over 200 different places that you can visit. This table is searchable and you'll go to find, find wetlands near you. That's the tab for this table. If you'd like to find a certain type of wetland or uh, wetlands in a certain ecoregion or city, you can use the search bar to narrow down the results. But we also have all of these sites on an interactive map where if you click on a site, you'll see a pop up that describes the wetland, how to find it, what you can do there, uh, whether it's wheelchair accessible, what types of wetlands are there, that kind of thing. And in the pop-ups, we also have links to our online photo albums for each of these sites. So you can get a feel for what's there. We took pictures of animals and plants and landscapes for all of these places. Um, we often also have a 360 picture where you can pan around in all directions, just as if you were in the wetland itself and uh, but without having to get wet like we did to get these pictures. We don't have 360 photos for all of our public wetlands in the map, but we do have them for about 80% of them. So here's a map of all the sites we had 360 pictures for shared on Google Maps. So now you have no excuse. Go find a wetland. <laughs> I do want to take a minute to highlight the nonprofit Carolina Wetlands Association, where I am a board member. The association just celebrated its fifth year in existence and has been doing some amazing things for wetlands in North and South Carolina. We are getting started on a volunteer wetlands monitoring project focused on a few sites around, around Raleigh, but we plan to expand it. Uh, as well as our involvement in with a number of communities to help them come up with nature-based solutions to problems like flooding, water quality issues, and just the need for open space. We also have a number of avenues we use for wetlands education and outreach, including releasing white papers on various topics and hosting events and exhibiting at conferences and having a monthly newsletter. And our Wetland Treasures Program uh, honors and brings attention to special wetlands across the Carolinas, whether they're public or private. So this map will have some extra sites on it that the ncwetlands.org site does not have because some of these are not publicly accessible except by appointment 
or tour. Uh, uh, these are on our website, carolinawetlands.org. We have this interactive story map of these wetland treasures, as well as fact sheets for information on each site. Right now we have 30 designated wetland treasures and we add about five more each year. That concludes my presentation, but I am happy to discuss or answer questions about our wonderful wetlands. Could you explain the difference between a marsh and a swamp? Marshes are wetlands that do not have trees and swamps are wetlands that do have trees. Generally, that's the difference. So a marsh does not have trees. Right, it would be a more open, I mean, you might have the occasional tree, but the wetlands that are dominated by trees, we call those swamps. And the ones that are dominated by herbaceous or low shrubs, we would call a marsh. I just wanted to say thank you. It was really wonderful, Christy. And um, one of the questions um, that came up at the beginning um, was about if you could explain mitigation and um, if the laws have helped. And um, I just wanted to remind everybody that um, we, it is a small meeting, so feel free to unmute and um, put your screens back on so we can see you if you ask a question. Oh, wetland mitigation came about in response to these wetland protections because developers uh, wanted a way to be able to impact wetlands on their site, but still have a no net loss across the country. Was That was the mantra that was um, being used. Uh, so, so people are, are allowed under the law, they are given permits or permission to impact a wetland area, but in exchange, they need to compensate for this loss by purchasing uh, mitigation in another place or doing it on site. And that involves either restoring uh, a degraded or drained wetland or sometimes creating new wetland area by scraping down an area and, and allowing water to flood in. And uh, it's done by planting tree species and the state requires mitigators to monitor the areas five to seven years before they release them. So there's a whole crediting system around this. And if you impact a certain amount of natural wetland, then you're told you, you have to mitigate a higher ratio because of the risk involved. But say, you know, if you impact an acre, you got to pay for an acre and a half of mitigation, that kind of thing. Uh, mitigation is very expensive. So one that is actually a little bit of a deterrent to impacting wetlands in the first place, but the state also and the federal level, they also require uh, developers to show that they are avoiding or minimizing their impacts as much as possible. So, it, you know, there's a wetland in the way, we're just going to fill it all in and not design our site around it. Um, that kind of thing is not really allowed so much anymore. And what's happened in North Carolina is, is we see uh, just overall developers and consultants are a lot more in tune with having to do that. They're a lot more ready to, to minimize and avoid. And so we actually have seen since this started in the 80s or 90s, we have seen um, a decrease in the total number of acres being impacted. At the same time, um, North Carolina also has some thresholds and the state, the feds also under which you do not need a permit. So, it, you know, kind of depends on 
the eco region that the wetlands are in, but it can be as much as an acre in the coastal plain that that total total wetland area in a project they're able to impact without having mitigation required. So there's it's a little uh, controversial or contentious as to whether mitigation is actually replacing the wetland functions that are lost. The best thing really is to avoid impacting them in the first place. And I think uh, generally speaking, we're doing better at doing that, but um, it, it, I, I do think that the laws have definitely helped because we have seen an overall decrease in the number of acres being impacted over time, but uh, we definitely can do better with protecting that. Someone on an iPhone said, do invasive plants have negative impacts on NC wetlands? Yes, absolutely, absolutely. I had one plant I did not mention is Chinese privet, which is a major problem in our urban areas, in our urban wetlands. Basically what happens with these non-native invasive species is they outcompete the natives and they will just completely take over and out, you know, shade everything. And the Chinese privet is notorious for that when we walk through like these mini forests of Chinese fruit, there's almost nothing in the understory. And Japanese stilt grass also does the same thing, kind of shades out, out competes a lot of things under it. Phragmites is a particular problem uh, in the whole coastal plain, especially around Lake Madame Mesquite, where it's out competed almost all of the cattail along the lake. So, so yes, it's a it, it's a persistent and difficult problem for sure. Are there any particular plants that uh, we should be planting in our backyard water gardens and things like that? Shade or sun? <laughs> well, any in particular that would be the most beneficial or, uh, or you know, the, the challenge, of course, of finding native plants uh, of, of all sorts is a big challenge. All the big box stores obviously don't carry them. Um, but are there are any in particular that we should kind of try and focus more on? Uh, I don't necessarily have good advice on that, uh, but I, I would say that I think that the species that are in the book, the more common wetland species, uh, they probably are able to tolerate a variety of conditions. And um, so I think I would go there first. The other thing is we, we have a rating system for um, fidelity of a given species to its to high quality habitat. So this rating system is described in the book, but for each species we have a score of zero to 10. 10 being these species are only found in the very, very best completely undisturbed habitat. And the zero being the opposite end of the spectrum reserved for non-natives. And one and two and three are, are more like the weedy things that can grow in a ditch, whether that with regular mowing, you know, they can handle lots of disturbance. So that reading system might also be helpful in narrowing some down. I would say I would kind of uh, steer to the middle range rather than, than the high C value species because they might be, you know, difficult to grow because they have pretty narrow habitat requirements. I hope that's helpful. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to chime in there um, just to say that um, in terms of wet, in terms of native plants, wetland plants are sometimes among the easier ones to get because of the mitigation programs. Um, so there are a good number of wetland um, nurseries that sell plugs that are more reasonably priced. And um, so if you have any trouble finding 
um, you can look on um, the NC Native Plant Society site, or if you, and if, if that doesn't work, feel free to contact me or reach out to our triad listserv um, for help. Can I um, ask a question real quick? <clears throat> um, can you comment on like Japanese knotweed? I know it's a problem along some waterways in Wilkes County, and I've seen some by someone's driveway in a ditch here in North Durham County, but is that something that seems to be a pervasive problem in the wetlands you see? Do you have a scientific name? I'm not, is it the same? Yeah. It's not the same as alligator weed, right? I, um, it has, you know, angular stems and makes kind of like into a shrub and has little white, um, little white spire like blooms but i don't know i just some friends are trying to eradicate it from their property out in wilkes county and they call it japanese knotweed and i looked it up and you know it's a problem but sorry right this second i don't have the you know that one i have not heard that much of so i wouldn't i don't it's probably okay. more of a localized issue I, it, oh it it's more of an upland species and um so it breaks and washes down streams and any little um, node will make a new plant. Yeah. And the roots are pretty deep and it spreads under. So, yeah. Okay. Well, that's good news if it's not everywhere. <laughs> um, one person was asking about a printed version of the book. And um, sometimes people don't realize if they have a PDF of something that is not a uh, copyright protected, they can get it um, printed themselves. And sometimes that's nice because you can get it spiral bound. Um, yes. But are there printed copies available? Uh, I am working on getting them printed okay. now. I'm struggling with the state bureaucracy. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I expect them to be available in the next few months. And if you want to get on a list for me to mail them to you for the cost of shipping or for you to come and pick them up in Raleigh, my email, just email me and I will put you on the list. Um, and it, it, it is not copyright protected per se. It is in the public domain. So yes, you're also welcome to print it. And it, it is pretty long, but it could be printed, yeah. So it would probably be a lot cheaper to pay for the cost of shipping uh, if they, uh, yeah. On the <laughs> yes, we are not charging for the books. We, that uh, funding for the printing has been provided by the EPA. So we are oh, super. thankful mm -hmm. and we'll have uh, several hundred of them available to just give away. <laughs> okay, and one other question was, um, is aquatic milkweed in many wetlands? And um, that's Asclepius perennis. Oh, okay. Um, well, not not really. I have not seen very much of that. Well, that's because it's not very common in North Carolina. But um, if you go a little bit farther south, I understand it's all through the Francis Marion um, forest, and I, I think it's much more common farther south. There is an Asclepius that is found in our wetlands. It is a swamp milkweed. Let me get the scientific name. The sleepiest in Granada. Mm -hmm. It has pink flowers, and I have seen that in the mountains, not a little bit in maybe a western Piedmont, but not not much. But that's not a. I mean, it's common, but not terribly common. <laughs> um, we did a program on monarchs last um, fall oh, for yeah. Xerxes and. Um, uh, a monarch biologist talked about how much of it was in Francis Marion. So that's the only one I know about. But, but here's a neat question. Um, is there any work on changing laws to protect and promote the keystone species beaver? Beaver. <laughs> Beavers uh, ha are being used in wetland restoration projects out west because, and even artificial dams to try to kind of encourage the beavers to come back into some places because what happens out west is if they can keep the water on the landscape either with beaver, uh, natural beaver dams or artificial ones 
it helps it to soak back into the aquifers. And beavers have been eradicated from, or at least much reduced from much of the Eastern United States, probably the whole United States. Uh, and they're, they are coming back. Um, I have not really heard about any laws about that. There, there's kind of a love-hate relationship with them with mitigation, unfortunately, because in uh, North Carolina, most of our wetland impacts are forested wetlands. And so the mitigation ends up being forested wetlands and uh, the mitigators do not like the beavers coming in and chewing down all of their newly planted trees. <laughs> so as, as much as they are, very helpful. They also um, can undo a lot of what, you know, mitigators are trying to do. <laughs> so in the East, um, they, they are definitely a topic of interest and um, they, they are, are also maybe more common than we realize even in our urban areas. But um, no, I haven't really heard anything about encouraging them. Um, there, there might be some things like that happening out west though, like in Arizona and Utah and Oregon and Washington. Well, um, Cecil, Cecil Frost has been doing research on them and um, showing their value for um, during um, flooding that it reduces some um, problems with flooding because the soils are are more able to hold water. So um, maybe, maybe he'll be, he's, that's his new thing and he'll be changing things in the East like he did for fire. So. <laughs> great, great. <laughs> okay, let's see. Um, so there's, let's see, there's a couple more questions. <laughs> Has Nutria spread through NC? Yes. They are in Lake Matamuskeet in particular and probably Swan Quarter. I'm not too sure uh, how widespread they are, but they are definitely in the east, uh, eastern coastal plain. And um, there's one personal question here. What got you interested in wetland ecology after majoring in herpetology? <laughs> well, I, you know, sort of a kind of a, a slow transition, I guess. You know, when I came out of working in herpetology or I came out of my master's in herpetology, the main jobs available for people with masters in, in zoology were in environmental consulting. And, and while I did do a lot of protected species surveys like for gopher tortoises and sand skinks and, you know, herpetological species in Florida. Um, still the, Florida has so many wetlands that I ended up, you know, splitting, my time was split probably two thirds with wetlands and one third with protected species. So um, that's where I, I was completely amazed by the diversity of wetlands and the wonderful, uh, natural Florida species in them. And um, so I just, I just, it's, it's kind of like that took me toward that path. <laughs> and then when I was looking for work here in North Carolina, um, the, this job was open and um, focused on wetlands. And I'm, I'm really happy to be here. I really have enjoyed working, doing this for almost the last decade now. <laughs>